in my heart. Oi. In my heart, a cloth is unfolding. Its creases are lined in a palm. Between my thumb and my pinky is a ring by which I expound. A barking instructional riddle that rouses you out of the slab. Out of the gates, out of Eden, to the fields you are alone to plow, where the silkworm swallows the silk thread, a long strand, exquisite and fine, that stretches like a Gilgamesh river to stir and awaken your mind. Wake up, naked soul, and get dressed. Don your garments of mourning and pride. And remember the source of the Tigris, and remember the Euphratian tide. And know that I gave you your feet, those wings of reptilian desire, to measure the pace of each step so as not to hasten the hour. For each man has his season to ripen, and your tree of life is still young. The viper still gnaws at your greenness that binds a father to a son. And as evening keeps rolling on westwards, the sun comes on George Bush to die, who, while bouncing his kid on his kneecaps, confides him these oaths and commands. Rush fast, my firstborn, back to Eden, and crush the snake's skull with your thumb. In my heart, a cloth is unfolding, unwrapping a diamond on fire, the carbon, the, the carbon, carbon, it whispers. Gold is dear, but the carbons divide. The carbon, the carbon, it whispers. Gold is dear, but the carbons divide. What is Saddam to you? To me, Saddam is a lampshade, which, standing between my eye and God's light, diffuses it more tenderly to all people. You have spoken truth about my light and tenderness. <laughs> Therefore, my tender light shall rest upon you too. Tomorrow, at the party's conference, you shall, shit, shall sit upon my throne. And what is Saddam to you? Saddam is, is the sea. Saddam is the jetty. Saddam is the city of foes. Saddam is the tempest at sea which shakes the aircraft carrier, but also the single flashing lighthouse of safety. Saddam is cause and effect. And because Saddam is being so benevolent today, you were able to speak of him so highly. Come our motherland next day of independence, you shall deliver my speech. And you, my dearest double, whose likeness to my image makes my mustache yearn toward your lips, begging to be worn, what is Saddam to you? Nothing. Nothing is nothing. Speak. Nothing. Lest I turn you into nothing, speak. What is Saddam to me? Can he ever be compared with a sun, a sea, mountains, a world? Though he is present in all things, neither above nor beneath these heavens, may his memory be found. And I, consumed by the awful privilege of serving as your servant double, am worthy only to be he who is unworthy of you, washed in agonized gratitude for failing to bear some remote likeness to he who has no like. Saddam is not a that. Saddam is not a such. There is no simile of Saddam. There is no double of Saddam. Now I know the deceit of those who came before you. Sycophantic, duplicitous doublings who, driven by their desire for self-gain, 
distorted the words of my life, words that I had graciously planted in their throats. Forgive me. You persist in your rebellion? Still you, who are you? Dare beg for yourself? Instead of crying, obliterate me, O Saddam, squash me, for I'm but a defective mirror. Shatter me, lest I stand between you and a new reflection, purer than myself. You burrow into your sins like a worm in warm feces. Kill me! Sew my head with this new wisdom, sealed in a lead bullet, so that it may never escape again. I will not deny you my grace. I am good. <laughs> I am that stone, covered in dust for thousands of years amidst an oasis mirage, pretending to be in Eden, as it's suddenly uprooted from its place and put in a fountain at the court of the Caliph, ever washed and ever molded by the sweet, sweet waters of the Euphrates. Me! I am good. Ah, I oh. am that moment in which a bee finally sees. I am full of honey. Oh. My ecstasy oh. and I are nothing but the transient humors oh. of Saddam. Oh. Artists harvest oh. the tartest hearts, and oh. artists harvest the tartest hearts, and artists harvest the tartest hearts, and oh. dandelions oh. delight in candelabras oh. de lua, dandelions oh. delight. In candelabras de lua, dandelions delight. In candelabras de lua. Stop. Your delirium of pleasure and pain, and behold in awed silence the master class of our ruler. I am good. <laughs> the man in me celebrates the monster in him. He celebrates because he conquers it each time and he celebrates because it remains unconquerable. of she-lions to dine on. Be the diamond down below. Be the diamond down below. Hand me a pen. Hand me an end. Hand me something to write on. Hand me a hawk. Love me even more. Hand me some fire to drink. Hides of she-lions to shine on. Be the diamond down below. Be the diamond down below. With, With a, a shout and, and a tirade, cry, cry wow at the tyrant. Cry wow at the tyrant. Cry wow at the tyrant. Hides of she lions to strike on. Be the diamond down below. Be the diamond down below. Hides of she lions to strike on. Be the diamond down below. Petroleum yoke in the Oval Office, 
are already crowding a tight. Hatching you, my President Ling, has been an arduous task. Where then are your vows of gratitude? I swear. Lo, Uncle Dick and Uncle Carl, they spent many a laborious year prepping the presidential propolis. The milk of your nurture is an extremely exotic fluid, a black butter indeed, churned of ancient kings of East. Without it, no American wheel can spin. You must therefore swear to sustain the perpetual pumping. I swear. Oh, crude oil petroleum, the phonemes of your name are pheromones in flight, puffing paraffin pollen, cocooning our thirst in nameless liquid tubes. I read in your office, you'll find heads of stars and Philistine sea laws awaiting your command to comb the globe. Your signature alone dispatches. Only your command is theirs. W. Bush. It's time to spread the stripes. Our newborn world order shall be delivered in your speech. Let's go to the White House. Wait. <laughs> Gone are the last minutes of your youth. But before one graduates as the world's commander, one must successfully answer his questions. Place on my table, world, the final exam. Good luck. Presidents, two, have a president. Name three of his names. The five-sided, the pyramid, and the hand. Which is the smartest of the animals? The eagle, the bee, or the sloth? The spider. It dodges the eagle, it catches the bee. Of the sloth, it knows not. Why did the Lord unlimb the land so that its pieces could establish a dialogue. What constellation cruises across the horizon? The star-spangled banner. What time is it? Twilight. The sun has reached the west and our sovereignty's shadow falls on all things past. Close your eyes. What is the shape of my eyebrows? Stealth craft. Who killed Cain? The Allah. The Messiah? Material. The father of oil? The sun. Its mother? Earth. How can man overcome thirst? By love of thirst. What do you, oil, and a donkey all have in common? <laughs> Customer awareness. <laughs> <laughs> Free, be free. Obey, obey. You have successfully passed your exam. Let's be Barbara, your peddler. Come. Colin Powell awaits your video call at the Pentagon. <laughs> All right. Burn. I'm thirsty. I am George Bush, the son of George Bush, the father, who always sees father. I have studied aerial photos of Natanz and Bashir, and I have learned that the cultures of the East was not destined for nuclear research. Therefore, my desire for destruction is driven by grace, not oil. 
the Sarsenet scarf blows westward in the Cajons, and for the gen genuine dream of the autocrat steers away from things reserved for the learned creatures of our free democratic society. For an Edison, a Sergei Brin. Therefore, I'll abolish all reactors, both those that are visible and those in mind. <coughs> uh, Sent a funny postal pigeon with the following message, baboon in bunker, wax all one last time. <laughs> Full stop, period. Shalom, Saddam. Who is this? I am George Bush, the son of George Bush, the father who always sees farther. <laughs> I deploy dung upon your face. <laughs> I scorch your corpse with acidic urine. I slash with a machete the vulvae of your widows. A sow in heat digs truffles out of your intestines. The sun dispatches vultures to pick at the blue of your eyes. I ravage your capsicum, scattering their meat. The banners of victory are all my schoolboy's saplings. I shove your torn penis down your gaping mouth. I lash out with letter bombs. An orangutan binds tight your testicular hill. Palestinian nectar lightning shoots through your veins. A grave digger dug a mountain over you. I spurt forged documents to confound your citizens. I eat your wife. I snort terror! Sucking her bones. I burn. I descend to oil. Lost in the wind. I descend 
to oil with no lift from my wings. I descend to oil. The rock has fallen. Duke, Marduk, my lip to lip, abundant with his ripened palms, he who rigs reactors with ringing drums, the honored donor of olive blood, boosting morale like Wallace Shawn, his cake loop spins catamarans, who oozes love like vanilla drizzles, thick white milk for his Saddam. My light and my shield. My God above, his thunders spring valleys to their feet, grinding mountains down to grain. Marduk is man and meaning, who by disc of force brands the land like signs of life upon the map. Bless the serp who kissed the gift of earth with knees of art. The Saddam cruises through meanings and beauty. The science of men states fructify dirt. For trading blood with death, Marduk shall hail his friend. The secret right hand shaken by essence and signals. The base of Saddam for red and ever. The coffee boils while he awaits. As the password whistles, he exults off the mountain by the sea. The colors dim to saffron tone beneath the setting sun. Tins of gold reassemble in the meadow sky. A multitude of hosts place the handle on the chest of our commander, bound supine. Blue clouds he recruits to his right, draining clouds upon the ramp. From jackal hides he reads a cry, hammering the night down for the time. Three hammer strikes upon the mighty iron belt. The shackled heart erupts in fire showers. The first and only rain to free the thirsty sands, burning an abyss into the heart of Saddam. Son of Tom sheds his skin like a silent shawl, nude. Thus, a dime drops in the chalice of surrender, in the cormorant's droppings, trickle down a Persian gulf night. What's a lamp to me? I descend to oil itself. Uncle Oil, <laughs> it's me, Saddam. Uncle Oil. Uncle Oil, where are you? Behold, son of Adam, your reflection in the petroleum lake. Oil, a mummified sea of light, eons of preserved night shining upon your thousand kingdoms. How wonderful, and also terrible. This is the sacred flesh of Tiamat reserved for the Leviathan's last banquet. It's being looted by the chain stores of carrion eaters. Lord! Behold, heart of Saddam, how alive is death. 
like a fire in a lamp just before it has been kindled. Breathe the vapor stream, have no thirst. Then the greenish sea will revive within your mind. Hear with strict attention how plankton flecks ferment, how bubbles burst and foam, how oxygen sizzles for you. How seaweed sweat is wet in prototropic plenty, bounteous with all life forms, each swimming to evolve. They drift from here to there, but all of happening is nuclear. The pearl, its mother shell, the whirling spirulina. They, they all dive deeper into the code of greenish sense. Yes, Saddam, you biology sophomore, solar seeds sprout just before you. Light beams shine within the brine. Sister stars of Ishtar flaunt their gowns of breath and water. In their greenish dance, they flash reflections of Nineveh. Inhale the spools of fish, all wobbling in silent joy. They gather in the court of the Leviathan. Sweet, much sweeter than any date molasses is oil. Oil! This bottle of seed dates back from your It ripened into birth black wine. This is your life's libation. But behold, Saddam, the casts are open. Devils are getting drunk down there. The barrels roll towards west and hell, where they fuel up iron wagons and tow them along their spider roads tracing the paths of our arteries and veins. Devils there are getting drunk. The future, Saddam, is at stake. Saddam, you're a little girl. Shut down the foreign embassies and eradicate all agents of the brothels, for they're disrupting the people's minds, licking spilled sperm from off their keyboards, spawning scoundrels and theater actors while pimps plunder the temple's treasures, sucking the light of the lamp. President Bush has, has the dick of a pig, and it's drilling into your soul in a diagonal, Saddam. <laughs> Listen, Saddam, to the voice of oil. Two today. Hmm? Ratatouille? <laughs> what? <laughs> Papa, look. Mm. Mm. I hear a gurgle. Father? All is being washed within you, my son. A sudden river begins to burn. The ashes inside you turn like a ball. You descend to oil. Mother oil? Hold fast to the string, my little kite. Look, Ma, I caught a cloud. I caught a big white whale. What's the whale looking at, Saddam? It's looking at Daddy and at Mommy. Well, who's looking at the whale, Saddam? Well, the whale Saddam is looking at, at me. Oil contains the spirit's secret. Use it wisely. But how shall I swear it to you, Mother Oil? Remember the sweet essence of the source. Nothing more. Goodbye, Saddam. Mother Oil, don't leave me. It's so good to be beside you. Come to me, little fledgling cub. I shall feed you one last time with my flammable milk. And by the ribcage of these calcium layers, I will hold you fast to my black bosom. In truth, you will never really leave me. But let me cradle you as a child now, in your last dream as a man. You're awake. You're back with us.
us, Father. Who are you? I'm your first born Uday. And I'm Kusei, your last. The sweet essence, Saddam. Nothing more. Mother? Father? Father! What were you dreaming? In my dream, I saw four fossils weeping. Who will tell me the meaning of my dream? There are four presidents of America carved in the mountain of rock. They are lamenting their defeat in battle. No, Kyuse, you're not right. Why should father wait to dream on something already known to him? My father and commander, in your dream, you heard the voices of fossil fuels crying from captivity to be saved. And you, my double, how would you decipher this dream of wailing fossils? I don't know. But I sense that these tears are tears of joy. <laughs> Indeed. How could he who is so dead deny himself the joy of being alive enough to cry? Yes. Tears by and all that is created. Perhaps this is the meaning of the dream that I had dreamt. No doubt. A sovereign's dream. No. No sovereign am I. Nor the ruler of Iraq. Sons, I am not your father. Double, you are free to your suffering. Father! No, Saddam. In the last hour, it is revealed, as always, that all of us are brothers. Let us therefore be ourselves. Let us not grudge our enemies their ignorance. Let us love one another as well as our defeat, for it is whole and absolute, like us in this moment. And if our blood be spilled from a clean and purified heart, may it fuel a lamp in the darkness of generations to come.
much, Mr. Argus. Thank you all for coming. And um, if you want to stay, if you don't want to stay, we have <coughs> some uh, cocktails in the time for you. And we're just going to put up some chairs if we have any left. Um, So welcome everybody to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY and to our final performance out of 10 for the Penbold Voices Festival. We are presenting the playwrights and we had uh, writers from uh, Burkina Faso, from Chile, from uh, France, uh, Cameroon and many, many countries and tonight we have with us Jonathan Levy and Amir. Um, so um, let's go maybe right away into the uh, uh, play, Brecht famously said, uh, photography about the Ford Motor Company doesn't say anything about the Ford Motor Company. What does the play tell us about Saddam Hussein? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Yes, we are also uh, live streaming and recording it. Um, so, uh, is it open? Yeah. Thanks. Well, Saddam here is both a political figure and a more symbolic hero. Uh, so uh, the, the treatise of history is not exactly uh, journalistic. Uh, uh, so I guess Saddam is, uh, is you uh, or me uh, or anyone, uh, the, like the representative uh, human uh, protagonist that leads uh, that leads the audience into, into some kind of uh, theatrical trip. Um, and uh, basically the, the, the first image of Saddam is being a dictator in a bunker with only uh, doubles to relate as like the, he's living, he lives in some kind of otherless situation whereas he can only speak with himself. Uh, I guess this is the predicament of, of, uh, of human beings <laughs> in general, uh, uh, sometimes. And uh, therefore he has to undergo some kind of transformation. And uh, I guess that, that's what the play is leading to, both on, uh, on a more kind of individualistic uh, level of narrative and, and as well as some kind of uh, pseudo-esoteric approach to history. Um, out of the many possible heroes, whether they are... Yes. As Leonard Cohen said, it's the uh, crack that lets the light through. And, uh, but um, it, out of the many heroes or possible leaders or dictators, I mean, why Saddam Hussein? What, did, what, why did it compel you to write about well, well, he's kind of a boogeyman of my childhood, you know. We were uh, living in Israel and he was on TV and uh, threatening all kinds of threats. So, so he yeah, has this kind of impression, uh, which is like this villain. Uh, and there was always these kind of, uh, I don't know, legends about having loads of doubles. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just what I had in mind. Actually, the first image uh, of Saddam, of writing a play about Saddam and his doubles, uh, lingered in my mind for about 10 years before I felt able to, to write it. Uh, I, I didn't have anything to say about it for quite a long time. Then it came. Then it came. But uh, the first, I guess, uh, emotional attachment to this uh, dictator was uh, him being a figure of my child, an action figure of my childhood. Um, Amir, you directed it. I think it also went to the, uh, it was in the festival at the Schaubühne in Berlin. Um, you also did that. What, what is drawing you to the 
to I didn't mind. direct the production that was in the show. Oh, oh, you were participating, yeah. Did, but I did direct uh, this reading specifically. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What was the question? What, um, what is, we talked about, you said this is a great play, we should invite, why do you think this is representative of a contemporary writing in Israel for the theater? I don't think it's representative, but it's um, <laughs> au contraire. Um, I mean, you asked me, hey, do you know any interesting uh, playwrights in Israel? I said, yes. There's one that I know. <laughs> what, yeah, why? So what's your... Um, um, I think actually, like from a dramaturgical... You know, I'm also a PhD student, so uh, it's, it's mixed this kind of uh, theoretical theories about why I think the writing of Jonathan is good, as good theater. But I think... Um, there's an offer in this kind of writing, both uh, Saddam and Rapul and other works we did together. There's an offer for um, a participation in a creation of deep knowledge that's um, not you know, this I tell you, not this I will dance for you, uh, but rather I'll create a kind of environment in which together we could we can go somewhere. I don't know if it, um, you know, if the reading conveyed any of this. Um, I was probably in some kind of other play, um, but but I think that in itself is important. Not only like you know, in Israeli. I don't know what it means to be, you know, in the Israeli context. Um, you know, important. But I think the offering, like the dramaturgical offering of Jonathan's theater, is. Um, yeah, Im important in all of the senses of the word. Well, in a way, it's a mystery play. It's demystifying a mysterious figure, but also then, um, as you might say, taking him down from the threat, uh, the boogeyman, to uh, something you, you, you are, um, in a way, in control of. Um, this, is it a spiritual um, engagement? Is it like a ritualistic, spiritual um, engagement as performance theater piece? I think all theater should aim, at least, uh, as uh, to have some spiritual uh, impact. <coughs> uh, I, I don't really think theater can exist in the full sense of the wor word uh, without uh, aiming at uh, something which is uh, we can call spiritual. It's kind of a vague word to, to mean something, uh, but but yes, uh, theater was founded as some kind of uh, conduction of uh, divine energies. You know, you, you bring the gods, you bring Athena, you bring Dionysus, you, you just actually bring them uh, to the stage after, I, I guess, the, the ancient mysteries were dwindled with, with their power. And following a few centuries of more kind of mundane and materialistic uh, theater, the 20th century has seen a resurgence of, uh, of uh, a more uh, encompassing and holistic and maybe daring uh, co conception of why actually to, to do all this strange thing uh, called performance and theater and, uh, and drama. Uh, and yes, I, th I think that uh, a stage is a condensation of, uh, of the world and it should uh, and it should place us as human beings uh, on the midpoint uh, between Earth and, uh, and, and something uh, higher, uh, e with each individual doing as, as best as he can uh, to, to make uh, new pathways uh, for that. So tell it, let's talk, uh, before we open up uh, very pretty soon, uh, the questions about your writing or writing style. Is one could claim it's a bit Kabbalistic, or is that uh, also hit lots of hidden meaning? Is there, is it surface? Is it Deep? Is it playing with bows? I don't what? know. I can't really tell you if it's deep you or could, not. You know, yes, but you uh, could. Yeah. Yeah. Is I, it? I, I, do you aim to be? I think that uh, when writer. you go in those realms, you should be a bit wary and uh, not to be uh, and both daring and wary, uh, so as to mean uh, as much as you can with a few words as you can, and always remember that it's uh, also uh, ridiculous. Because if you, if you take everything too seriously, uh, you're not going to get too far. Uh, in order to get really far, you have to be uh, silly. Uh, or, or some kind of interesting combination. Like, like 
press uh, a, a two-tone chord, uh, both on which is aiming at the sublime and uh, the profane, I guess. Uh, unless you don't get, art doesn't uh, stand something which is too, I don't know, too, too spiritual, yeah, too single-minded, any kind of uh, direction. Uh, you, you get the ideological, and, 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 that's, uh, and the, that's a catastrophe. No comment. No comment. <laughs> okay, and uh, just a bit about uh, the oil, the idea, of course, it's, you know, the holy oil as the oil riches, I guess. So what is, what, what is the, it, in there for you? Well, oil, uh, of course, as a political, concrete, uh, substance it, it really makes the world go round you know there's n nothing no material uh, thing which is uh, driven so so much uh, um, going around uh, like like oil that was redundant but uh, when you think of what actually is oil it gets much more interesting because oil is organic matter okay you've got trees and, and animals and I don't know, kings of east and dinosaurs and uh, I don't know artichokes and everything and you just <laughs> press them down and bottle them in the m in earth for millions of years and then it becomes oil and oil becomes plastic and everything that we call synthetic is actually has a, a, a organic origin and everything organic is basically the sun and that gives scientifically quite an interesting uh, uh, concept of what is oil. You take the sun and you put it in a earth cellar for so and so million years and then it's precious again, okay? And you've got it uh, politically, it's uh, connected to, to the Middle East, which East of course is like what comes before and in Hebrew it's actually the same word, before and East and uh, and the and the sun begin, begins, of course, with the with the you know, with the east, and it goes to the west. And people from the future are coming with their pipes and lines, and from the west, and to to drink uh, this precious eastern uh, liquid. Uh, so that gives kind of a j just reading the news, you have kind of a strange Lovecraft mythology already, mm -hmm. uh, and then you only have to develop it and see where. where See how imagination can can develop this kind of uh, new mythology about news. It's interesting. There's a saint uh, Hussein of the holy oil uh, who, <laughs> we, like that, yeah. who we experience. But um, uh, let's uh, open up right away to to, to questions or uh, uh, comments to the audience. Again, we have a microphone, and um, to be not only to hear it better, but also we are recording it and live streaming it. So we'll start over there. I'm sorry, Stanley, are you, Stanley is here? Can, I'm sorry, can we, can we, thank you so much, Stanley, for the very okay. thank you. I'm sorry, I forgot, you, you saved us today, thanks. Did the light. Yeah. Yes. Light and oil, that's uh, important, yes. Hi, uh, since your work is somewhat poetic, I wonder about the process of translated, translated from Hebrew to English, and do you have a special connection to English? Because you seem very fluent for an Israeli guy. <laughs> <laughs> to both of you. Uh, we we co-translated this thing, uh, and uh, I don't know, really, really because uh, in Hebrew it sounds different, and uh, it's much more based in on the phonetics of Hebrew. like. There's certain elements of wor word play in, in, in the English that I hope that we manage to maintain. Uh, but basically, uh, I consider language as an organism, okay? You, you sp like speaking with Hebrew, you can speak with Hebrew. You don't have only have to speak Hebrew or speak English. You can speak with English. Like uh, you, you can approach the, the, the whole language as some kind of spiritual uh, organic entity uh, a bit like oil, uh, and, uh, and, and then writing becomes something very, very intimate and, uh, and creative and, and a bit strange. Uh, did we manage in translating it? I, I don't have the tools to, 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 to judge. Uh, I don't know. 
I don't speak English, you know, regularly. I usually read it. So that, that's how I have this kind of, uh, probably kind of this Shakespeare Borat uh, <laughs> <laughs> melange. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you born in Israel? Hmm? Born, born in Israel? I was born in Montreal. And, and I was born in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> But we both grew up in Jerusalem. Yeah. What age did you come to Israel? Four. Well, maybe I'm your question But also. But it is something interesting because actually my mother tongue wasn't Hebrew. And, but I know Hebrew far better than I know English. So I, I still, I always felt a bit alien to, to speech in general. It's, it's like, a, it has some uh, deep bio, biographical meaning, uh, the, the, actually, this question. I mean, for me, growing up in Israel, I, there was one thing, like we used to have Bible class and I couldn't understand the words Um, and I'd ask, because I'd ask, I'd say, I want to use an English Bible, uh, because you know, I speak English very well, and you know, I, uh, this is how I understand better. And of course, then it's kind of simple. He went there, he did this. You know, that's, it's, it's <laughs> like, yeah, I can read it, like a, not even an exciting prose, you know? Um, and, I, and translating this play was a little bit You know, this, I had that uh, in my mind, this kind of challenge, how to not make it like really bland. Uh, and then I think in the early versions it was, it became this super ornamental text, which, you know, uh, swirls around itself in digging for uh, alliterations and, uh, you know, and it was just a mess of, you know, Hebrewish um, with, uh, with a pomp, but also mitiomer, you know, um, potentious, potentious Hebrewish. Um, and actually, actually Joshua Cohen, um, um, author, uh, stepped in to really help us, he sat with me, uh, gave him a lot of time uh, to clear up and make sure that, you know, we're speaking English uh, and not some, yeah. Um, yeah. And I want to I wanna boast on one uh, translation uh, thing that we did, because in the Hebrew, <laughs> I hope it's okay. In the Hebrew, there is a point that it says that Marduk boosts morale like a great casting decision. Avrakat lihuk. And in the translation, we said he boosts morale like Wallace Shawn. <laughs> and I think that really, that's someone that, I, if we did that, I was just really happy that, you know, we can put this show up and this is... You know. And Wallace Shawn would be very happy. Wallace Shawn, he boosts morale, you know, and he's a great <laughs> uh, casting. So in the transition, you just do the thing you talked about. Which I just, yeah. <laughs> Comment or question? Yeah, maybe we go here and then you. Can you talk about how you take a, really a long, very long poem and conceptualize it in a visual physical way on stage, to stage it. Can you talk about your process a bit? Well, my, I mean, we, f we produced the play as an ensemble with uh, Sal Sekely and Ilsha Ulof. Um, we were like the four dedicated people to the idea. And then ideas kind of came in, and this is um, really based on the mise-en-scene that emerged in 2011. So, and back then, a lot of it was based on, we studied uh, Gurdjieff movement, sacred dances of Gurdjieff. And then we had different, it's a, it's a great question. It's a very um, difficult task. It's never clear who needs to pick up these lines and what, when is a chorus and when is a singular. And it, it involves a kind of, more than anything else, a musical logic. Like, not even, you know, what does it mean, but what sounds good, uh, what, what feels right. Um, and then there are specifics. I mean, every, every little decision has its gene genealogy that I can, uh, but I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, <laughs> it's a huge question, how, how to direct stuff, actually. Uh, <laughs> and uh, especially like more poetic stuff. Uh, so you have to kind of extract what is the, let's say the, the, the poetic line is about, 
Okay, you have, you, you have to pinpoint uh, the kernel uh, of what you're saying. And then you have to re uh that same kernel in some visual form. Uh, and it can go various ways, but we don't have enough time to <laughs> expound on that. Hello. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, Mannheim and here yeah, on the bus. The bus. <laughs> so I have, I have more than one question. It'll be very quick. It's only because I saw it before, and it's really exciting for me to see it done differently. So in Mannheim, it was in Hebrew. And I was wondering about a couple of things. I was wondering about the, the relation between the sound slash music to the, the language and how, how this work is done. Uh, do they play to one another or not? How is it done differently now that it's done in this space? So this is question one. And I feel like there, a lot of it is, is let's say, be, because the, this is a reading, uh, we didn't have many rehearsals at all. We did I, two rehearsals with the actors and two rehearsals before that with the musicians. And the idea was um, to figure out the spaces, to figure out, for me, every scene, what, yeah, what's, the, what's the space that we want to evoke. Um, and then that creates a kind of uh, vocabulary for the musicians, and then just listen to you know the text. And the actors too, um, you know, they they step in a room. There's already elements for every scene. You gotta listen. Uh, and I, I think they did a, a, a really amazing job. They re they met twice, so they can just have to I guess switch to a to a listening uh, mode. Well, very quickly, the other question, if I can, uh, is I'm just really fascinated by, by <coughs> two things happening at the same time when you're looking at oil and speaking about it this way and just thinking of politics of extractionism while looking at this at the same time thinking of dramaturgically of the other kind of extractionism that performances like this do when they're like trying to dig into what theater can do differently and how Dramaturgy can be used as a tool to reflect on news or in politics differently other than the journalistic. So it's just interesting for me these two, uh, yeah, how it works in different directions up and down as it extracts. Well, it's in, in a way, it's the same direction because you want, uh, if, you, if you're kind of ambitious uh, in your theater work, then you want to transform. And then transformation goes everywhere. Uh, it goes to how you uh, consider yourself and what you consider important in life and how do you look upon external uh, worldly events uh, as deeply meaningful in a way. Uh, so it's one thing. Hi, Hi thank you very much. Uh, I love the use of Lear. It was perfect, beautiful. Um, and I even like the actor, he slipped on the first word that was funny, especially because you're mixing serious with absurd. You might want to have that happen all the time. So. Ah. <laughs> but I, I had problems with the transformation in the final speech. I <coughs> didn't expect that. And I, I, I guess I want evidence of that somehow. Maybe you can explain. Well, it begins with King Lear and it ends with Prospero, OK? The, the end is also a kind of Shakespearean illusion. Uh, there's three Shakespearean illusions. There's Hamlet and the his relation with his uh, the swearing with, with, with his dad. I swear. Yeah, and and there's of course King Lear in the beginning, and it ends <coughs> with the last uh, with the tempest and the end of the tempest, where Prospero just lets go of all his powers and he and he's ready actually to die, and uh, so that was kind of in the back of my mind uh, as 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 a narrative, you know. Uh, plundered from different plays. Uh, and there is some kind of jump uh, in that scene, how it suddenly addresses uh, and speaks kind of this uh, humanistic, uh, broad uh, speech uh, about uh, humanity. Uh, yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, um, tying in with that question, what's the difference between putting it on stage in Germany versus here politically? And what's the line like, kind of associating with Hitler, like how far can you go to emphasize with the um, despot and is it the way to understand this or is there a ethical like that you can't, you're not allowed to cross? Well, I, in Germany we were just invited to a festival, you know, we, we put it up in Israel and we were invited. Uh, so it was interesting, you know, apropos Hitler and bringing the mustache dictator. Uh, hmm? Ah, we were all with mustaches uh, in, in Mannheim and in Israel. We had this kind of uh, uh, discipline. We, you don't shave a month before a show and then you, you keep only the mustache. Uh, I, well, being an, is an Israeli in, uh, in Germany I always have this kind of uh, overtones. Uh, so Saddam was the least of our troubles. Uh, and, uh, and, and as for the second question, you, you, would we sympathize or do this kind of dance, uh, dramaturgical dance with the, with the Hitler? I don't know. It depends. I think everything is possible and everything, there are no ethical boundaries at all uh, as something to begin with. You have to work with the art and work with the world and work with the context. And every time it's a bit different. I, I don't really believe in some kind of axioms which are uh, right everywhere all the time. Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, so you have a certain date and you have a certain context and you have a certain idea and a certain audience and you have to do your best with making it uh, interesting. Uh, there are no general ethical rules uh, for playwriting. Maybe then just one comment. Hussein, if I understand right, actually saw himself as a modern, uh, modern leader. Uh, he was hated by bin Laden. He, uh, actually women didn't have to wear headscarves. Uh, they were in political positions. He wrote a book actually on democracy. Um, he was honored to see himself floating around space. Um, you, in a way, put him in an occult, mystic uh, uh, context. Is that a political idea or is it a, a theatrical performance? I need uh, uh, to reiterate it. That's a question. I, 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 I don't. I think you know what I mean. So uh, please help me. Try to, uh, <laughs> to understand that he himself was a modern. He saw himself as a modern leader. But meanwhile, you put him in kind of a medieval. Yes, this uh, kind of uh, um, Parsifal. Yeah. Yes, Parsifal, uh, occult. Yes. Mystery leader. Um, is it a political? Was it? Is it a political idea? Was it just a theatrical idea? What is I the think profound it, I, philosophical idea? The thing it? is to put the politics in its proper place. You know, politics is uh, too invasive. You know, everything is just politics, politics, and and it kills uh, people. It just uh, it kills the, the view of, of it humanity. Killed it killed him too. Yeah. Yes, he killed himself in that way. But uh, just seeing everything only in the perspective of politics. Uh, is uh, has to be stopped, uh, and uh, and that itself, in a way, is is a political statement because you say, okay, uh, let's look about uh, on events, mm -hmm. even for the for the sake of a hypothetical uh, fantasy, uh, look at what happens at the world in different concepts. Uh, if you stick with politics, you'll get uh, boring stuff. You know what I mean. I do, I do exactly <laughs> what I mean. Um, yeah, many theater companies also work in different, I think it's a, that's why it's so interesting. It's a different solution or different, uh, you know, there are lots of, also very good political theater. And there is, there is, I'm just, actually, I, I'm making uh, it a bit uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, um, harsh just for the, the sake of. of Remini or others, um, but um, another comment or question over here, yeah. For someone who's unfamiliar with your other work, I did want to ask, um, are there questions that you find yourself returning to or subjects that particularly interest you? Um, yeah. Yes, yes. Your other works also, yeah. Yeah, I, I've got some. In, in context with your other works? I am. Um, big question. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> 
Yes, it, it is part of a, a, a larger body of works. Uh, there are certain themes which come back uh, again and again, and dealing with politics in, let's say, in a more kind of, uh, in this way, is, is something which uh, happened a few times. Uh, Maybe two, one, two, three, two exam, one, two examples of other well, the, the uh, play after after Saddam Hussein was called uh, Raful, which uh, we cooperated uh, as well. Uh, and Raful was this kind of uh, general, right-wing general in Israel, okay? Uh, with the famously known hatred of Arabs and a laconic language. And he was this kind of uh, adored by the right-wing, hated by the left-wing kind of type. Uh, but he had this interesting twist in his biography uh, of marrying a far left uh, wing uh, activist. Okay, she, they were really in love. They were kind of lovers for eight years before they got together, and they had this uh, crazy <laughs> relationship. And after, and he uh, after he retired, he went to the. He was. Uh, responsible of building a new port in Ashdod, which is an ancient Philistine city on the coast of Israel. Uh, and he died there in one tempest. It just took him to sea, uh, and he didn't know how to swim, and he died. <laughs> okay, So he just went out with a bang. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, his widow, just uh, in an interview in the paper, Sunday, uh, uh, told him, uh, told the, the press that he was, every night he had this kind of dreams, okay? He, he had nightmares of all the people he killed, all the friends he com uh, and, and soldiers uh, that uh, were killed under his command. Uh, he had two sons that died. One died of asthma when he was 10 years old, and the other was a soldier in a plane crash, and he had this, every night he would go through this crazy mystery drama of meeting all the voices uh, from the dead. So it was like a gold mine of drama. Uh, and as well as a certain approach which is political but not political. You know, it's, it's so boring to be critical against wars and generals and you know, everyone know everyone's against wars uh, or against dictatorship. Almost, almost. Oh, yeah. oh, usually, you know, here in New York. Um, so, so this is, uh, I say, an example uh, at your request. But and there's, you know, ev every project has its own uh, story. But uh, maybe uh, yeah. talk a bit about the project we originally also thought to invite, but we couldn't make it work. Um, the sleeping, yeah. Ah, the sleeping thousand. But that's a long story. Should yeah, you can make it? Uh, it's, hard, it's an it's opera. Saddam Hussein. No, it's no, in now Forty minutes. Okay, well, um, I'm working now an opera in on. An opera on an opera yeah. uh, on an opera <laughs> uh, to to be premiered in Aix en Provence uh, next year. Uh, it's political sci-fi, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bit uh, future uh, oriented. Uh, well, you're all welcome. I am uh, invited heartily. Welcome. Welcome. welcome to come. Uh, but I don't want to tell the whole narrative. It would take. Just a little bit, no, just a little bit in broad outlines, maybe. Yeah. Uh, should I? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, well, the, the thing is that the, the narrative is... Hmm? Two sentences. Two sentences. <laughs> Who are the you can do it two sentences. Hmm? Uh, Who are the, you can explain Who are the sleeping know. thousand? <laughs> the sleeping thousand are a thousand Palestinian... Uh, uh, administrative detainees, which are people in jail with no trial, uh, and the the the, uh, the story goes that they go on a hunger strike, okay, as they sometimes do, but this time the hunger strike has esoteric influence, and there's no rain and no wheat, and everything starts to die in Israel, so and they can't let them go, and they can't put them to trial, and they can't kill them, so the uh, uh, solution is to put them to sleep, okay. So, and they take all these detainees and put them in a huge dormitory, and there's a thousand Arabs sleeping, and this is how they uh, solve the problem, okay? At least for the meanwhile, because after a few years, 
the Jewish population starts to suffer from uh, insomnia and nightmares, and there's something strange going on. And the psychotronic department of the Shabak, which is the secret uh, service, uh, understands that among these uh, thousand sleeping Arabs, there is probably a unit of lucid dreamers uh, which uh, found a way to uh, <laughs> dig, dig uh, energetical tunnels to the U Jewish psyche and perform terror attacks uh, at will, okay? <laughs> okay that, that, that's how it begins. Okay? <laughs> Those are the sleeping thousand, and that's only chapter one. So, so it goes, uh, <laughs> Well, um, and maybe uh, with that dream, uh, that's, that's a good moment to, um, uh, to end. We are slightly over time. And um, thank you uh, for thank coming you all the way from Israel. I'm here thank, you. You together. thank you all for coming. And um, both of them will I hang around here a little bit more. So please feel free um, to uh, uh, join. And we will have a little reception around the corner. It's called the Archive Bar on 36 between Fifths and Madison, if you want to join us there, or anybody, it's the end of the festival. I also would like really to say thank you to the fantastic Siegel Center crew that made this all happen, and uh, it was a big group effort. Ten plays in three days is for every organization a big deal, so uh, thank you everyone, and thanks to Penball Voices for creating that festival, so thank you. Thank you.